When was the last time you were at an airport? Probably not long ago. Perhaps last summer, maybe. The sky has always fascinated humans. We have always tried to reach new heights. The history of modern aviation proves it. If you thought flying was a recent thing, a modern impulse of humanity, you are dead wrong. It started a long time ago. The history of our obsession with flying has its origin in Al-Andalus. When in the 9th century, Abbas E. Firnas, an Andalusian scientist based in today's Malaga, designed several flying methods. His first attempt consisted of designing a special suit that he believed would endow him with bird-like qualities. Ib Firnas put the garments on, climbed to the top of a tower, and jumped. Unfortunately, the fabrics didn't help him levitate, and he fell hard. However, he did not give up. After the first failure, Ib Firnas, who had survived the fall, tried to improve his prototype. Creating a wing structure that would indeed make him fly. And he was not wrong. This time he succeeded. Ib Firnas climbed a tall cliff, and from there, jumped with his prototype managing to glide for a while. But the problem was not the flight, but rather the landing. I am Gabriel Ureta. I am Bethany Ashcroft. And this is... Sounds, Sounds Like, like infrastructure. infrastructure. Many tried to emulate Ib Firnas. Among them was Leonardo da Vinci himself. But the first flying prototypes were not European. The first airplane was created in the United States. When brothers Orville and Wilbur Wright tried their Flyer 1 in December 1903 in North Carolina, Okay, okay. This thing about flying is quite interesting, but... Have you ever wondered what the first infrastructure created for these purposes was like? Do you know when and where the first airport was built? The first airport ever constructed was College Park Airport in the state of Maryland in the United States, near Washington, D.C. This airport is not as the airports as we know nowadays. It hadn't uh, any terminal. It was just a runway in the middle of nowhere. Victor Vicente works as an asset management manager at Ferrovial Airport. It was just a plain terrain in which the, the aircraft could land, but it was not any special location, any special uh, technical characteristics in order to allocate this, this location for the airports. In the beginning, airports were pretty rudimentary, but that changed quickly. From this kind of airports, like College Park, there were many, many updates to the technical issues, operational issues uh, of, of the airport to evol to, in order to evolve, to evolve until the airports that we know nowadays. But the first evolution, I would mention uh, Sydney Airport, at the first airport with a commercial terminal in which the passengers could spend some time um, in restaurants, in bar, in well, whatever, before they board to the plane. However, despite the infrastructure, the Australians did not carry out the first commercial flight. The first commercial flight happened between two cities in Florida. It was not a crowded flight, though. There was just a single passenger than a pilot. The adventure lasted only 23 minutes and covered a distance of around 30 kilometers. One huge step uh, I would like to mention regarding these updates, this evolution of the, of the airports was in terms of the security, the installation of the first security checks in the 70s. Back in the day, airports were pretty much like bus terminals or train stations in terms of security. However, this changed with 9-11. Shortly after the terrorist attacks, security checks became more like they are nowadays. The main difference between those first security checks in the 70s 
and the ones that we know currently today are mainly the technical and sophisticated techniques that we use to detect some metals or whatever it is or explosive, explosive uh, substances that in those first security checks it was almost inexistent of course because of the technology that we use nowadays that was not able to use uh, back in the day in, in the 70s. Another evolution of the of the airports was the first boarding gate that was installed by Delta Airlines in the airport of Atlanta. However, the invention of terminal fingers is not the biggest nor the most important development in airport infrastructure. And by fingers, we're not talking about the delicious chicken ones you eat with fries on a Saturday night. In 1947, a commerce revolution began with the creation of the first duty-free in one of Ireland's airports. It was decided to install these duty-free shops just in transatlantic uh, flights, and you were wonder why. And it's because the transatlantic passengers, I mean, the passengers who are going to take a transatlantic flight, they arrive to the airport with more time uh, ahead of the departing time than the passengers that are going to take a domestic flight, for example. So they have more time at the airport, and the airports wanted to assure that the passengers at that and the, at the airport are spending money in their in these specialties shops, restaurants, duty free shops. So it was a good idea for them to maximize the revenues, taking into account that they are going to have the passengers more time ahead of the departing time when they are taking a longer flight. But what makes an airport an airport today? An airport for me is a place where you go and it's going to allow to connect to people that is far away. And Laura Lopez Sotomayor is the CFO of Ferrovial Airports. So for me, it sounds great, you know, because it's it sounds like holidays, like, you know, leisure or in other occasions it's business and then allows to connect with other colleagues that are far away. One of the company's focuses is airport management. Ferrovial's portfolio includes airports such as Dalaman in Turkey, and it also manages terminals all over the world, including at JFK. But beyond managing airports, Ferrovial also wants to highlight the positive social impact its infrastructures can have. Innovation is, is critical for our commitment with the sustainability and the environment to protect, for example, the birds. We use drones and also we are analyzing how we can incentivize in our airports the consumption of the sustainable fuel. Hydro is very keen on that, it's offering incentive to the airlines to use um, this uh, for sustainable fuel. They are trying to see how in the airport they can store the hydrogen. So it's really important, you know, also for the passengers, for our commitment with the environment and our commitment with, with the net zero. A clear example of this is the work that's being developed during the construction of the new Terminal 1 at JFK in New York. Ismail Ordóñez is the head of asset management in the United States at Ferrovial Airports and one of the people working on the JFK project. All the roof of the terminal is going to be covered with solar panels that will provide not only the um, electrical needs for the terminal, but also generate hot uh, and chill water for the HVAC systems of the of the terminal. So, a lot of other, I mean, and this is complemented with other initiatives such as fully electrical uh, fleet of uh, the ground handling equipment, reductions on plastics, and other initiatives that we are trying to implement to reduce the impact of the new terminal one on the environment. Nonetheless. These goals are not unique to JFK. With the goal of eventually operating the terminals with 100% renewable energy, Dalaman Airport, which is also within Ferrovia Airport's portfolio, installed 15,000 solar panels in both terminals of the airport. With these panels, the airport will generate around 11,000 megawatts per hour of electricity by, and by year, making this airport one of the first airports in Turkey to, to implement this solar panels project. It is necessary to find ways of integrating the infrastructure with the people who share the space with it. The construction of JFK New Terminal 1 is a good example of this, where Ferrovial has tried to involve the surrounding communities in the project. 
So in terms of uh, um, you know diversity goals, the the project has the target of a 30% MWBE uh, participation for you know overall not only construction but also operations and throughout the project. And so far in the construction of the phase A, which is the work that is currently happening on site, we are achieving those goals and even exceeding them. Also, we have a 10% target for participation of local business enterprises, which are defined through a set of zip codes surrounding the the airport. And as well as with the minority um, companies, we are meeting those goals. And not only that, there's also goals in terms of workforce, diversity of the workforce, participation of women, and all those are tracked. And in most of them, we are on, on track to meet or exceed uh, them. And on those that we are lagging a bit behind, there's initiatives to try to catch up and deliver an exemplar work. One of the most interesting and ambitious socially responsible initiatives is perhaps the Kailos project. In terms of innovation, I would like to mention as well that AGS is leading the consortium that will develop the first zone network to transport essential medicines, blood, organs and other medical staffs and medical supplies. In 1992, the French anthropologist Marc Auguet defined airports as paragons of the non-place, empty spaces lacking life and devoid of identity. Ever since then, the goal of architects, engineers and airport authorities has been to turn airports into the exact opposite. In this episode, we have reviewed the past and present of airports, so our analysis would be incomplete if we do not delve into the speculative exercise of imagining the airport of the future, the one that is yet to come. What will it be like? In my opinion, the main changes are going to be linked on how to make the passenger journey more seamless and easier for the uh, you know for the travelers. Although the challenges are going to remain on how to comply with the regulations that will be imposed. So how to balance privacy and security, how to make sure that every stakeholder is happy with the new technology. So it's gonna take time and probably it's not gonna evolve as fast as it is gonna evolve in other industries, you know, such as, you know, the supermarkets or, or the phones uh, that will, in my opinion, evolve much faster than in the mid and long term. We are going to see aircraft that are going to use more sustainable fuel instead of fossil fuel. Also, maybe they they have hydrogen, so the aircraft has to be refurbished and they have to be adapt engines for these more sustainable fuels. And also, I think we are going to see a revolution in the EVTOLs that is going to be amazing. They are 100% electric and they are going to make even more attractive to flight. The future of the airports, more than being um, a travel hub in which the passenger just goes to take the plane that it was just uh, back in the day, in the future, well, nowadays actually, it will become a commercial hub in which the passenger goes to the airport not just to take the plane, not just to board and travel, but also to, to be a leisure hub, to enjoy, have fun, have lunch, whatever it is, spend some time, some uh, the time before the um, before the boarding, more than just being just a place when you can take the the aircraft that will that will bring you to to your destination. Thanks to Laura, Victor, and Ismael for taking part in this episode. Hungry for more? You can enjoy many more stories by listening to our other Sounds Like Infrastructure episodes or checking out our blog. I am Gabriel Ureta. I am Bethany Ashcroft. And this is Sounds Sounds Like Like Infrastructure. Infrastructure.